Yes, were they at the beginning of progressive rock. They were there before progressive rock was really formed. Like all the great bands, they had ambition, they had vision, they had a musicality, they had a virtuosity. They just broke all the rules. They did anything they felt that they either wanted to do or could do. Classic Yes are, are one of the probably the finest British bands of that ilk. They weren't kind of just rockers that went on and sort of turned up very loud and, and played. It was very sort of thought out, very cere cerebral music. They wanted to take rock music outside of the three minute pop format and then they wanted to take it beyond the sort of stuck in a right hard rock format. It was away from Beatles, away from the Rolling Stone. It was still so powerful at the time. And it became very dreamy. So I'm sure a lot of teenagers at the time say like, oh wow, you know, and it's like, it's different. Sunshine is creeping in And somewhere in a field A life begins so Yes started out as John Anderson, formerly of a band called Gum, and Chris Squire, formerly of a band called The Sims, they came together, it was their vision, it was their band. Early on, they had been listening to a lot of, sort of West Coast bands from, you know, from California, um, lots of harmony singing, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, um, The Birds, in fact they covered a Birds song on the first album. I think they liked that kind of, all the harmony singing that was going on in those West Coast bands. The world outside would take it when it came, and life's the same. The first album, I think, like any band, you know, they'd been gigging around, they'd got a record contract, they'd gone into the studio, and they were experimenting, they were trying to find their feet. Yesterday's endings will tomorrow life give you love. It's got the harmonics that they would use, vocal harmonics that the, 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 the band would develop. The Association, or even the Beach Boys, they were the kind of things John Anderson had been listening to in the 60s. And you can still hear that American timbre to the harmonies that they layer on top of the songs. So the first album is quite sweet. Um, it's got a few sort of mini pop operas, uh, survivals, one track. Um, so it's actually very different to, you know, the, what's regarded as the classic Yes sound. One of the reasons that, that many of the, the, the classic prog rock band's first albums are a little musically off kilter to the, the, the rest of the, their, um, their catalogue, simply because, you know, it's, it's the first one. It's like, well, you know, we did have this kind of crazy idea, but can we execute it in the studio kind of thing? So though Yes were still trying to find their ground, still trying to find a way forward, and progressive music as such was very much a young genre, the first album really did establish a style for Yes, and out of it came particularly Pete Banks, a guitarist of tremendous range, tremendous enthusiasm, and particularly great vision. Peter Banks was playing guitar, in the band at that time before Steve Howe, um, and he's a very, very different guitarist, kind of guitarist to Steve Howe, so um, his influence is more kind of maybe Hendrix inspired. A couple of the group songs, Survival and Look Around, uh, did actually become standards in the Yes live set for a while, but by and large the album really failed to fulfill their vision of what they wanted it to. They were perhaps being too ambitious given their inexperience in the studio and the result was probably more pop than it was prog. I think the first album announced Yes as a band who were out of the ordinary. This was not a group that you could categorise in the ordinary language of, of rock or pop music. They were distinctive and they were unique. Yes, I mean, had two sort of main reference points, sonically, I guess. Um, one was the quirky time changes, often led by Chris Squire's bass playing. Um, and the other, of course, is John Anderson's very distinct vocal sound. Mm -hmm. 
oh, I think John Anderson's voice is is yes. You know, whether other band members accept that, don't accept it, fans do or don't, if you really look at the music without John Anderson's voice, it wouldn't be yes. They would actually have to rename themselves something else. Sometimes when I listen to, to yes music, if John's voice didn't come in and, and sing these sort of nice melodies and harmonies and stuff, I might get a little bored, you know, because musically the, the, a lot of the changes are so rapid sometimes you need something to hang on to. And John's voice being so distinctive, you know, you could hear it off a car radio or something. Yeah, that's definitely yes, there's John Anderson scene. He wasn't out of his depth when the band started um, coming up with more and more kind of complex musical arrangements. Um, he could incorporate the voice easily and perfectly into those complex arrangements and um, really sort of deliver some great work. He's got perfect pitch. His delivery is, is unique. His lyrics are certainly unique, uh, whatever you think of them. He is one of the, the most individual and gifted front men in music ever. John Anderson has a, an alto voice um, in contrast to most rock singers who sing with a kind of raunchy tenor voice. Um, that meant that his falsetto gives his lyrics a sort of ethereal quality. The bass chair in Yes from the beginning was always Chris Squires. He played a Rickenbacker stereo bass, which was a sort of quite, quite a new instrument at the time. It's got a very hard, trebly, twangy sound, a very hard metallic sound. So almost didn't sound like a bass at some points. Um, it could almost sound like a guitar. Um, Chris Squires would also use distortion pedals and all kinds of effects pedals, weird and wonderful things, to even further make the bass much more of a featured instrument. He plays bass very often like a lead guitar player. He's just got this phenomenal style. It's a very sort of, very melodic bass playing style and very fluid. Um, you know, he doesn't, um, he doesn't so much attack his bass, it's almost kind of like caress the sounds out of it. His musical knowledge was very good. So he would choose different root notes perhaps than somebody who would just play the chords. The bass wasn't just sort of your average bass that would sort of, sort of mark time. They were like flowing runs and lines that were like almost melodies within themselves. And again, that's like, a, I think, a real secret ingredient of yes. I'm not convinced that just his bass playing would have made that much of a difference or an impact on how yes worked, didn't work, etc., etc. But his character, his personality certainly has. Without Chris Squire, Yes would have taken off and never really come back down to earth. So he's very much the earth mother, as, you, as it were, of the band, which allows John Anderson in particular to go off on his sort of strange, mystical journeys, always knowing that Chris Squire's back on earth, holding him by a string, and at any moment can pull him back and say, right, let's get back to the basics. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily describe Tony Kaye as, as a great uh, keyboard player in the sense of a, a Rick Wakeman or, or Keith Emerson or someone like that. He's not flamboyant, uh, but he does what he does very well. And, and he's more interested uh, in rhythm than, than necessarily in melody. So it gave the group a very good foundation in the early days. When Tony Kay came to Yes, he had a strange background. He was with a group called the Federals, who were basically your run-of-the-mill 60s beat group. And that's why he concentrated on playing the organ. That was the instrument that he was most easy with. It limited Yes's sound to an extent, which is why in the end he was replaced by Rick Wakeman. But it also gave those early tracks a real drive, a real Hammond organ type push, which gave them a bit of a soulful edge. And that's something that they never quite recaptured. He anchors the sound, he's part of the fabric of the sound, and for that reason he's often overlooked, but he's a very accomplished, very competent keyboard player, and he's doing just what's demanded from the early songs, and he, he played a very large part in putting Yes on the map. Well, Teddy Kay was a pianist and an organist, and that's where his forte lay, and in those areas he was particularly inspiring. And when he and Pete Banks, the Yes guitarist, combined on the first two albums, there was a tremendous sense of surge. They really did lock together in a very exciting manner.
Bill Bruford, as a drummer, is one one of the greats, really. Certainly in this progressive field, he's very uh, highly influenced with jazz. You know, he's always he's always loved jazz. He's always enjoyed playing. Um, he's a great great drummer. Um, visually very exciting. He's very expressive. He's very conversationless with it with his playing. You know, he likes to interact with other instruments. Um, he, he he has this buzz about his playing. It's very difficult to carve a unique signature as a drummer, more so than almost any other instrument. You've got a very limited palette, a very limited range of sounds to make your, your impact with. And for somebody like Bill Bruford, who can actually make their impact by the way they place the beat, uh, is a huge gift. What he played was played extremely well. Clever drumming, which is not for everyone's taste, and certainly often not the best thing in a rock band but then it's debatable to say whether yes we're ever a rock band. He was good, he was very technically perfect, but he's, to me it's like he just come out of a very good school. I mean, he was missing the, the gut feeling in it. He was too perfect sometimes. I mean, cymbal are beautiful, but it, to me it's too many roar, too many technical thingy, you know, here and then. If it had someone who was a little bit more of a sort of plodding drummer, it wouldn't have had the amount of fire that the early records have. Um, and I, I would put a lot of that down to, to Bill's playing. Bill Bruford was 18 when he joined Yes. Um, and in fact, he described himself as being um, an 18 year old virgin, and Yes was his first girlfriend. Yes had done the first album, just called Yes, on their own, and they were trying to find a style and a range in the movement. For the second album, they'd already decided, we want to go in a direction that is very orchestral in style and sound. They wanted to be the modern Stravinsky in some respects. They had a little bit more courage now. They'd made one record, the record company hadn't dropped them, you know, and so their experiments were beginning to pay off. They were starting to get a fan base, people were coming to the shows. It was up and running. No opportunity necessary, no experience needed, was a Richie Havens song. I think he'd have been surprised to hear it start with a uh, hefty organ burst, followed by some wild swirling strings, and then Chris Squire's zooming bass line. They were looking at lush harmonies, they were looking at almost Wagnerian instrumentation, rising, falling, crescendos, diminuendos, a mixture of classical and pop music. It's the way they, they, they meld a Richie Havens song <laughs> with, I think it's um, the, the theme music to um, The Big Country, <laughs> um, the, the old film. It was uh, unexpected, so I mean, we were over, overcrowded with, you know, pop music, it was very cheesy, so I mean, they came and they make a difference to many people, you make them discover, oh, it could be that way too. The problem was that they didn't quite bring it off, and the, the orchestra ends up sounding as if they were trying to do something completely different, and when the orchestra did the big country theme, it's so out of context, it makes you sit back and think, what the hell are they trying to do? Later on, on Time and the Word, particularly with a track called Astral Traveller, it did work a lot better, but by that time they'd adapted and relaxed into using an orchestra. Without question, Time and the Word was, was a, a big improvement on the first album. The band were now beginning to find their feet musically and they were able to present a, a much more mature sound. We were definitely moving towards the classic Yes sound. The songs were more puffed up um, and they used uh, classical orchestral musicians 
to get the more pompous sound that they were looking for. But it was done with a sort of naivety and innocence that really is the album's saving grace. I think they overstretched themselves with the second album. It had its moments. There's a very good cover called Every Days on, on the record which uh, they did quite well. There's also Astral Traveller and The Prophet, which really started to hone down where, yes, we're going to go in the future. But in reality, it was Apache record. <laughs> It was better technically. It was better recording. It was uh, it was more well thought album. They did out of the sound, you know, not just the beautiful music. It did out of all the sound will 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 get out of the speaker. The separation between the instrument, the vocal was a lot more prominent in the up front. It was more sensual. John Anderson um, had started to develop his uh, science fiction lyrical style. Um, which would become more cosmic as time went on. I didn't think it was as good as the debut album, personally. It wasn't bad. I mean, some very interesting tracks on there. But as, a, as an album to listen to today, I still prefer the debut album. The other problem they had was that Pete Banks was doing things that they weren't quite happy with, far more jazzy things, far more extra exploratory things that were exciting and probably the best performances on the second album came from Pete Banks, but it was clear that he was going in a different direction to the band. So by the time the second album came out, not only was Pete Banks out of the band, he was off the cover of the album and his replacement, Steve Howe's photograph there, even though he had nothing to do with the record. One of the main men in Yes's early years was Pete Banks, the original guitar player. But it was literally when he was replaced by Steve Howe that Yes kicked into gear. Steve Howe, the guitar player, uh, brought lots of things to Yes. Uh, first and foremost, a great technical ability as a guitar player, but a very all-round guitar player. You can hear in his playing and, and all the Yes stuff, country, a bit of jazz, rock and roll, a bit of funk, a bit of Hendrix going on, a bit of classical and experimental stuff as well. Not even jazz, just experimental sound, soundscape stuff. He stretched their musicality to the very limit um, by his inventiveness as a soloist, also as a writer, I think he expanded the band as well. I think once he started writing with John Anderson, that really changed, so sort of shaping the sort of classic Yes sound. On the Yes album, it just bang, there you go. It's whoa, where did this all come from kind of thing. You know, that album put them on the map. We put our music together it's what I've got and what's John's got and what the other guys have got you know I mean somebody doesn't decide like, can you write the best song in the world today Steve you know I'd say what are you doing you know I've got some stuff and some of it's pretty good you know what I mean so there's that confidence you've got to have about yourself so the way that you come to that fruition and when the things start to marry together in the arrangement is when people are delivering the best things they've got <laughs> The Yes album is the first album really to show the full potential of the band. There are no more covers on this album. Instead, there are six quite long, complex songs of their own, um, which have complicated arrangements, um, a series of different moods, all contrived, but all working towards a single aim. Yours is No Disgrace was the real start of Yes. 
It had multi-layered harmonies, had different aspects to the music that were very confident. It had moods. In a way, it had movements as well as moods. And it was a lengthy piece that allowed Yes to stretch out. Yours is no disgrace is a, is a kind of miniature symphony if you deconstruct it. It works at so many levels and, and it's no surprise it's become a standard for the set over the last 30 years. It was simple but it was also very, very clever. And it, it's a shame in some ways that bands don't try and record tracks of that sort of minor epic length. I think it was what, 10, 11 minutes? It worked so well. It had a flow to it. It had um, a bounce, had an element of rock, a lot of progressive rock, um, but it had a lot of melody in it as well. It starts very sort of small, and um, then within sort of a minute, it's got absolutely huge. There's sort of two or three sort of monster riffs going on where the guitar and the bass both sort of play the riff together, and um, it's exquisite. It's very, very exciting. And um, again, Anson's voice, which is probably the highest he's ever sung, I think. Um, it's almost unbelievably high. Um, that brings great tension and drama to the music. Leon is not this great. He has, has been again, technology has to do with it. Because each time they came with a new album, technology was different. It was getting better. Plus they are so new, they sound. They knew more who they were, or to work together, and that could be could be heard in the music because he was getting more sophisticated, more better arranged. And finally, yes, had found their range and their mark. In a song like Your Move, All Good People, it's, it's a classic example of Yes's willingness to change mood, to change tempo, to shift the song, to take us into to different areas. Uh, and it's a very subtle approach that the band has. The harmonies on Your Move are woven tightly together into various patterns and into also different layers. And the effect is really to produce a sort of shimmering vocal landscape. The basic ingredients of this track is a three chord trick, which is E major, and then A over an E root, that's an A major, then a B major over an E root, and back to an A major over an E root. That's the first section. And on this one as well, which is really nice, is uh, the bass player um, harmonizes the chords to create much more of a sort of Bach-like sequence. Then the second section gets a little more clever. The second section goes to E, and then it goes to an A with a first inversion on the bass, then it goes to an E over a B, to an A major, then to an E with a G sharp root, then to an F sharp minor, then an E with a G sharp root, back to an A major. As I said, very Bach-like. Very typical of Yes, uh, somebody would hold a, a chord sequence and the keyboard player or the bass player would actually move around musically underneath. So one person would, would play the main structure and other people would add and harmonise and remove and you know, create different sort of feels by doing that. This is the great, um, a great example of really of how skillful Yes are. People always assume that there are lots of different changes of key and time signature and all that kind of thing. Not necessarily the case. 
you get the impression that the keys have changed and that because of the, the different tempos of the song you find almost as if it's a different uh, time signature but it's just really how Bill Bruford again very skillfully places his accents in different places and gives you that sense of a shift but a lot of Yes's music is actually like that. <laughs> This was music that they'd been seeing and hearing and not always being able to capture in the studio. Now all of a sudden they were doing it. They'd learnt, I think, from Time and the Word, they put a lot of sort of orchestral strings on and that didn't particularly work. It sort of was sort of really kind of ultra pompous and there is a pompous side to yes, but in a nice way. So I think they learnt well that they were using string parts, but not an actual live orchestra. Um, they were using like keyboard strings. The problem was, Yes wanted a keyboard player who was also accomplished on synthesizer. That was not Tony Kaye's forte. So sadly, although he was very much prevalent in the first three albums, his time was very much up with Yes when they moved into a more classical oriented style. The irony being, Tony Kay came from a classical background, but it was the wrong classical background. His grounding as a pianist meant he was part of an orchestra. Yes wanted him to be the orchestra. Mr. Rick Wakeman, Rick Wakeman brought um, a huge increase in the range of sounds available to Yes. Whereas Tony Kay had really only used three keyboards. Um, Rick Waitman had a dozen racked around him, and they weren't just for show either, he played them all. This really sort of heady brew of sort of techno space rock that, yes, were kind of developing. At the time, Waitman probably just thought, oh, great, this is something to get my teeth into. Rick Waitman played with the group called The Strobes, who'd supported Yes quite regularly. So they knew exactly what he was capable of. He was somebody who could play piano. If you remember Cat Stevens' Morning Has Broken, that was Rick on the keyboards. He also played on Bowie's uh, Hunky Dory. He could play organ. He also played the mellotron, which was a huge instrument with tape loops, a kind of primitive sampler. He basically was game to play anything and everything. Rick Wakeman was the keyboard man. He was, uh, he was out of it. He was like a, a man living his dream on stage, no matter what. He just didn't care. He was coming in the band and say, here we go, I can do that, I'm going to give you that, and voila. He probably turned Yes, who were a fairly complex band anyway, into even more complex arrangements and sort of longer, more epic kind of pieces. In the studio was where he really gave Yes the edge because he could link themes and he could knit things together. He could come up with 20 chord sequences to use for a particular song. He was basically sketching out a route map for the others to follow. Fragile is the first album from what's regarded as the classic Yes lineup of John Anderson, Chris Squire, Steve Howe, Rick Waitman and Bill Bruford. And we were very honest about the state of the band, even though we didn't say the band is fragile, we just called the album Fragile. But that was about, okay, so Bill did see it on the flight case and kind of go, well, why don't we call it Fragile? I think Roundabout as a song brought together everything that Yes had been trying to do for years. There's fantastic instrumentation in there, wonderful vocals, um, very clever, tight arrangement, and huge amounts of energy. We bring all of the elements of Yes, all of the skills in terms of composition and playing, and we boil it down to this nine, ten minute song, which contains all of the great musical hallmarks of this band. The rhythms are big and bouncy, and the vocals are fluid and melodic, and it's Rick Waitman's keyboards that act as a bridge between the two. 
what happens is uh, when the band comes comes in, you get this really kind of great classic rock and roll riff coming in. Uh, you've got the acoustic guitar, which gives it a real lift, a real lively kind of driving vibe to it. Um, and the bass and drums are just straight ahead. It's got all sorts of different elements in it. It's got a bit of rock and roll. It's got a sort of melodic vocal thing. Uh, it's got a bit of funk going on in there. A typical track uh, of Yes. About three and a half minutes into the song, you get a new new motif coming through. You get this repetitive unison riff uh, played on the bass and the guitars, um, structured in a four-bar phrase. Um, but what, what's happened is that they've given it a new colour by adding lots of percussion. You've got shakers, cowbells, tambourines. Musically, I mean, it, it, it does what it says. It, it kind of it, it goes around and around. It's, it's got that kind of rhythm to it. It's, it's a very satisfying song to listen to. Fragile is probably the first great Yes album. There's a sense of inspiration. Everything about that album gelled and fitted. Roundabouts on there, Heart of the Sunrise, Long Distance Runaround, run all, they're all there, all these fantastic songs. Long Distance Runaround is a song that's it's only about three and a half, four minutes in length, but it's, it's very, very, very well created. It's, um, they've got some quite, quite complex things happening in this song, which, which work very well. Uh, it initially comes in with this guitar riff, and this is a little melody that's played in harmony between the guitar and the keyboard. Uh, and basically what it is, is it starts off with an, a C arpeggio, harmonized, and then it goes to a, a B flat major seventh chord, and then it runs up arpeggios of G back up to the C again. So there's basically three chords on this tune, which is your C, your B flat major seventh, and your G. It's special, uh, first of all, because of the harmonies between the guitar and the keyboard playing it. And there's a little bit of jazz in there as well, Django Reinhardt. With a bit of swing to it, sort of gypsy swing to it. Um, and also the use of the arpeggios running up, both instruments playing them together. It's quite unusual, certainly for the time. Uh, it was called progressive rock, and it, that was musically very progressive for that period of time. And then when Bruford comes in, he gives this show tempo, fast two effect. He does this by, you know, um, a constant uh, four on the, on the bass drum, and he's giving all the offbeats on the ride cymbal. So that, that immediately gives it that kind of show tempo type, almost comic element to, this, to the beginning of this song. Distance run around again has all of the quirky musical hallmarks of yes. C major, very straightforward key, four beats in the bar, but in the hands of Bill Bruford, it sounds like something totally distinctive. The only time we change key is when the verse is introduced uh, and we introduce the two sharps as John Anderson begins to sing, but uh, that's all there is. But when you hear the song, it sounds as if we've, uh, we've been playing around with keys and time signatures, but nothing could really be further from the truth. There's only one change in the whole song. The, the, the age-old gag thrown at prog rock bands is, um, you know, that everything lasted four days. And, you know, yes, we're a perfect example of a band who could stretch out when they felt the need. Perhaps there is an argument later down the line that they stretched out for the hell of it when they didn't need to. But they could also 
write a complete piece of music that lasted three minutes. There's a sense on the production where Anderson really is just sold, go in there, do what you have to do, we'll build everything around you. And this is one of the tracks that really underlines what John Anderson was about, because yes, we're learning to adapt their style to Anderson. He became the linchpin of the band, the most important member of the band, and the rest were starting to learn that and starting to fit in with it. And there was no sense of egotism, there was no sense of why should he be the main person in the band. They knew how important John Anderson was and they were adapting to him. Cry Guy is absolutely one of the best. It was like, it's a masterpiece. It is, you know, it's, it's well put together. It's, it, I don't know, it's well arranged. It's very well produced. It's a, a great recording for the technology at that time. And you can see it's, it's a heart in it. It's not just beauty moon music. They put a heart in it. They put the love of music in it. And I'm sure people, you know, notice that. The fragile probably doesn't have the consistency or the flair of close to the edge. Um, it was made up of individual compositions along with group compositions and there are a couple of tracks that um, are below par, frankly. Um, but perhaps the most interesting thing is that the band themselves, you can tell, are not yet sure of how far they can stretch themselves and you get the feeling that there is still more to go, which indeed there was. There was more to Yes than just the, the musicians and the music. You know, there was, uh, there was a lot of teamwork behind the scenes that brought originality. In the era before we had videos, album sleeves were the best way for a band to get their image, their message across, to give you something that wasn't contained in the grooves. And when Yes linked in with Roger Dean, they obviously brought a new dimension to what they were trying to portray. As you can see behind me here, that Roger Dean's uh, artwork played a huge part in establishing the identity for a band like Yes. His, his landscapes are on one hand abstract uh, and otherworldly, but at the same time there's, a, there's an air of familiarity about them, and I think that, that's struck a chord very closely with, with the music. So, you know, miraculously, not only was the music right, but the, the look of the record was right too. This, this fragile world that Roger had, uh, had drawn for us, you know, looked like, it really looked like something, you know, when combined with our music and the emergence of the beginnings of the logo started to come out. So all of a sudden, yes, not only had the music and the opening to, to chart in America, but also we had a look. Because the first three albums, whatever you think musically, the sleeves were rubbish. They really were awful. This was the first time they had a sleeve that represented where they could be going. Roger Dean was a visionary in the way he presented his art and also reflected the music. They were busy, they were interesting, they were fascinating, but they were never cluttered. And they made you want to look at the sleeve while hearing the music. It was a piece of art. It was so well made, so well drawn. And I'm sure people put in the work just for the picture because it was beautiful. And it's why he stayed with TS for so many albums because it's like for a while, if you didn't see that, 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 that painting on the, on, the, on the Yes album, it wasn't on the Yes anymore. The, the uh, Yes album, Fragile, um, Close to the Edge kind of trilogy w w was uh, establishing uh, the styles and the direction of Yes. And Roger was doing that visually. The inner sleeve of the Close to the Edge album, with its endless waterfalls, constantly flowing um, is almost an essential visual aid for listening to the track. Close to the Edge is a, is a, is a real epic. It's over 18 minutes in length and it's divided into five or six different sections. Um, initially you get this kind of just just sounds, guitar sounds and, and very quiet opening and then suddenly it, it crashes into this what at first sounds very frantic, very kind of hectic 
all fast playing, everyone's playing at once. But actually, on listening to it, it's not quite as complex as it seems. The bass guitar and the bass drum are both um, just playing on beats one and three of the bar, um, which gives it a very simple, grounded feeling. Um, what Bill Bruford is doing with his, with his hands uh, on the cymbals gives it that sense of urgency. He's doing a lot of double time, a lot of bouncing on the cymbals with his sticks. There's a sense of discovery about the track, um, as much for the band as for the listener in terms of the shape and the form that it took. Um, this is complex music being played with real gusto and it stands the test of time magnificently. Close to the Edge was a song that I began writing literally about living next to the River Thames, you know. So but John converted that into a song about the world, if you like, and that's, that's I suppose, that's an indication of artists working together, is that you by the time you've pulled a couple of ideas, you haven't got something that's twice as good as the first idea, you've got something that's multiples. The next section of the song is, uh, is split up by um, the bass and drums playing this 3-4 groove. Again, a, a great use of 3-4. It's quirky, imaginative, uh, not often used by many bands. Um, so they, they have this grounded 3-4 groove, when over the top you have this vocal melody, which is actually in 6-8, um, but it's double time as well. So it gives you this really great crossing over feeling between vocals and rhythm. a great piece of music to listen to. 20 odd minutes of a mixture of tranquility and chaos. There's lots of uh, time signatures uh, where the tempo changes and a completely new tempo starts. Uh, there's lots of key changes um, just bouncing around all over the place but somehow they managed to make it a sort of a very sort of uh, congenial whole and so it sounds actually very organic. Six minutes into the song you get this real twist with it because the bass and the drums are now playing in 4-4. Four, four. Same tempo but four beats in a bar. So they've got this two bar phrase where the bass and the drums are doing this kind of dark, funky, funky sounding riff which sounds great. And then over the top you've got this same melody that was used before in 3-4 but the melody is in 6-8 and it keeps on going. So what you're getting is the effect is, is overlapping phrases. The vocals are continuing while the bass and drums ends and starts a new phrase, then the vocals will end halfway through a drum and bass phrase. Um, eventually it meets at the end, but it's very, very clever writing. It wasn't gibberish, it was them trying to do different things. Um, there was a, and a lot of soundscape, what we'd call nowadays soundscape was going on, although it didn't have that name in those days. Um, I wouldn't say it's a masterpiece, but I'd say it's a very interesting piece of music. Close to the Edge is, is really is truly a masterpiece. Um, it's probably my favourite Yes song. It's, um, it's a real epic, you know, it's, uh, just when you think that it's maybe the end must be close, it, or it starts to die down a little bit, it's way back and it's a whole new section. About 14 minutes into the song, we've, we've just been left with this huge organ sound. Um, sounds like a you know, massive cathedral organ. And then it goes into this high energy, um, really kind of 6-8 vibe that's going on. And what you've got is the drums. They're doing this high, um, kind of urgent sounding uh, drumming by he's, he's using the cymbals and the hi-hats. Um, but he's predominantly really centering it around the snare drum. He's, he's uh, doing very, very quick kind of sex semi semiquavers on the snare drum. Um, giving this constant energy running throughout the whole whole section of this song. By the time they recorded um, this track, their studio 
technology and their studio knowledge was, was vast. They really had, um, they knew what they were doing. So um, there's all kinds of wizardry that goes on. In some respects, guests were allowing their own ambition to outstretch what could be achieved at the time. Their music on Close to the Edge was ahead of what could be done technically or technologically right back then in the early 70s. But it's still got its wonderful moments. The fact is, though, you can't have something as huge as that that lasts as long as it does, that works all the way through. Close to the Edge is a good song, but I don't call it a masterpiece. It's missing something. It's missing the gut feeling he was in on the song. It's missing the sensuality of it. And that, again, maybe due to the production. You maybe want to creamy on it. When I asked Rick Wakeman which Yes tracks encapsulated what they were about in the early period, he said two tracks. He said Awaken or Close to the Edge because he felt both of them basically started and finished when the inspiration struck and when it ended. And in between times went off on as many tangents as it wanted to, but without pushing things too far. All three pieces of music off of um, Close to the Edge are, are all masterpieces. Close to the Edge and You and I, Siberian Car True. What I'm going to do now is illustrate uh, a little bit of a track called Siberian Cat True. And uh, it's very typical of a Steve Howe lick, a riff. Um, and what he would do uh, generally in a, in a lot of Yes songs, he'd, he'd have a riff that he'd repeat in different keys. Uh, and in, in, on this particular riff, although I'm only going to play it in the one key to illustrate it, he would play it through several parts of the song in different keys. So the main riff for Siberian Catra, and it goes like this. <laughs> So as you can see, it's a, a constant riff, a circular riff that's, that's moving round and round and round. You can keep playing that, then you can move it to a different key as the song progresses, as the tune progresses. Very typical Steve Howe riff. Um, but what they're doing each time with this riff, they're trying to build it up and uh, Bruford, um, he, he's, he's you know, kind of adding semiquavers with his cymbals and his hi-hats and kind of some, some double pedals going on with his bass drums and he's, he's really kind of giving it this building, driving effect, putting it into a fifth gear, if you like, each time. Lyrically, I don't know where it's going. I wouldn't pretend to know where it's going lyrically. But musically, again, it's unique. It's different. The rhythms are, are, are very stylish. It really is John Anderson going into his Eastern religion interest. But it works because it's the band locking together. The band seemed very much in phase with John Anderson on this track, whereas on Close to the Edge they lost away a little bit at points. With Siberian Catcher that never happened. <laughs> The piece unravels a series of moods without ever really getting into your face, but somehow you're more impressed with their instrumental and musical creativity than many of the better known, more ego-laden pieces. Some people have little time for Siberian Katru because they don't feel it has any great meaning to impart, but if you ask Steve Howe, or certainly when I ask Steve Howe, he reckoned that the power of this piece and the melodic grace of And You and I were the two sides of the coin of what made Yes what they were.
You and I starts with lots of nice acoustics, and so you'd get that sort of warm, acoustic -y, sort of close feel to it. Good arrangement, it was a long tune, but well arranged. It would come back to the same sort of melodies, with different chords underneath them, different rhythms underneath them. And that's one of the things about you and I, I think, that's really important. Was, you know, I don't know if John wrote all the melodies for the vocals, but it was a very strong, melodic vocal part. You and I works particularly well, I think primarily because of John Anderson's vocals. The lyrics were, were good, the lyrics were clever, um, and it's probably the only 10 to 12 minute love song I've ever heard um, and admitted to really liking. On this track it's, it's, it's Anderson that's really shines, um, and he has a tendency to maybe um, over sing on a lot of Yes songs, um, but on this he's actually he holds back and it really benefits. So there's a sort of immediate, there's sort of some drama and tension there. And when he does sort of give it some, eventually it's the, all the, the, the release comes and uh, the tension is broken. It's fantastic. <laughs> And You and I is regarded as the masterpiece on Close to the Edge and it works because it has a very simple basic melody. Everything leads back eventually to the And You and I refrain which is very simple, very softly sung by John Anderson and allows people to join in. Certainly one of the most heavenly moments in the entire Yes repertoire. By this point, I think the band were so well oiled, and um, you know this sort of basic groove between sort of Bruford, Howe, and Squires, and Waitman was so they kind of knew what the others, you know, other guys were going to be doing, so they could sort of almost read each other's musical minds. Now, with Bill Bruford, having him and Chris Squire as a rhythm section was almost a dream, but you can't have too much of a good thing because of the type of drummer he was and is. It never really gelled properly with Yes. Yes didn't want someone of his virtuosity. They wanted someone a little more solid and a little more grounded because they wanted the other instruments to be the orchestral performers while the drums were solid, rooted and always gave the other instruments something to come back to. And it's not really a surprise that when Bruford did finally quit Yes, it was to join King Crimson. For certain that Alan White, who replaced him, hasn't got that kind of individuality. But then again, unless you're Cream, which had Eric Clapton, Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker, yes, another of those signature drummers, all soloing at once, you've got to have something that's a bedrock. And what Alan White provided was more of a rhythmical bedrock. Yes recorded Tales from Topographic Oceans in the summer of 1973. Um, when they were on a high after Fragile and Close to the Edge. It's fair to say that Tales from Topographic Oceans is the most controversial album that Yes ever made. Um, opinion was divided not just among progressive rock fans, but even among Yes fans. I can remember both myself being disappointed and all of my contemporaries who were big Yes fans uh, getting the album. I had to deliver newspapers to be able to afford it, so I was, I was very bitter uh, at the number of Sunday posts I had to deliver to be able to buy that album and to find that it kind of meandered. It didn't have a, a central quality. It was hard to, to pick out the, the, the melodic highlights or the rhythmic highlights. It was a bit of a mush. Topographic Ocean was like, for me, was the album of Yes. I just love it. It was long song. It was double album. And the hard work was beautiful. The music was beautiful. And it was what I was expecting music to become. 
I don't know, understand why it was received so badly with, with the critic because to me it was, it was, it was a masterpiece. Why was Tales of Topographic Ocean so badly received? <laughs> because it's a crap album. <laughs> I think it, it works because it's completely overblown and completely nonsensical and utterly ludicrous. Here you have a double album and you've got four tracks in that double album. Each side takes, has one track and that is it. It was ludicrous. It was such a bold, brave experiment. The band have to be applauded. Perhaps some production editing would have been advisable. Um, maybe uh, it was everybody was experimenting once again and seeing how far they could push the envelope. But it wasn't very well received because I think people felt they'd become a bit self-indulgent. Tuneless dirge that goes on over four sides of vinyl. And what on earth are they talking about? John has gone through various periods in his lyric writing. In the late 60s and early 70s, uh, he was into Eastern mysticism, and that is clearly evident in what he was writing. Some of it works, uh, some of it doesn't work, some of it didn't make any sense at all, some of it was uh, abstract, some of it was poetic, uh, some of it just sang well. He often used his vocals as an instrument, not just to say the words. I think if you look at it in that context, then he was brilliant, but like any lyricist, he's going to have some things which are rubbish. Each track has a sense sometimes is losing its way. In fact, sometimes they start off and you wonder, do the band actually know what they're trying to do? They sound like extended jam sessions with the five guys looking at each other saying, uh, where are we going with this? Legend has it that uh, cardboard cows were standing in the studio, an idea of John Anderson's to give a nice pastoral ambience to things. Didn't seem to work, did it? Things did start to get a little spinal tap around this time. Uh, at one point, John Anderson decided that he wanted to recreate the vocal sound that he got singing in his shower at home. And so he got the engineers at the studio to dismantle the shower from his house and reconstruct it in the studio. There were moments in each of the four tracks which work. Overall, each track probably does fall down because there's too much fat on it. It's an album that makes you happy that punk turned up. Rick Wakeman, who left soon after the album was made, uh, described the album as uh, wading through a cesspool in order to get to a lily pad. They gave it a go. I think most of us agree that it didn't really work. But then again, they produced three classic albums. The critics had enjoyed those. It was probably time for somebody else to take the praise. Once Yes had peaked um, and gone through the hubris finally that was Tales from Topographic Oceans, um, it took them a while to come back and then the shifts in lineup really began to take their toll. You had Genesis on the one side who were perhaps a warm band and you had Emerson, Lake and Palmer on the other side who were perhaps a little cold, clinical, chilly. Yes were somewhere in the middle. They didn't freak you out with their instrumental virtuosity, nor did they go for the down-home tales that Peter Gabriel spun. They were somewhere there in the middle, a nice happy medium, but I don't think by being between the hot and the cold that they were lukewarm. I think they had their own place there, which thousands of people really tuned into. 